Khan reporting that Canada's GDP was essentially unchanged during the month of July. Uh, we're talking about 0% growth. Let's bring in Robert Kafsik, a senior economist at BMO Capital Markets. Robert, great to see you. Thanks very much indeed. What were the most important two things in that GDP print for July, do you think? Well, I would say there are two big takeaways here. Number one is this isn't really clean data because we had a we have a few special factors going on. We had wildfires in June, so there's a bit of bounce back from that. And we had a port strike in July, so there was a bit of a negative impact from that. It, it mostly scrubs out. So I would say number one, it's not totally clean. But number two, and the, the bigger takeaway I would say is that there's pretty clear evidence that the Canadian economy is struggling right now. And beyond some of the impacts we've seen in the last two months of data or so, we've gone now, um, fully six months where the Canadian economy hasn't grown on a real GDP basis. So pretty clear signs that we're slowing here. And you say it looks as though for Q3 we could have pretty well a zero growth quarter or at least very low growth. Yeah, and like so assuming we get a little bit of a bounce back um, in, in, in August and September, we're probably going to see pretty modest growth in those months because past interest rate hikes are still weighing on the Canadian economy. But even that, the arithmetic kind of says that it's going to be it's going to be tough to to, to churn out any growth. And, and our, our official forecast here is that we have something kind of below 1% in the, in the, in the low 0.3.4% range. But um, looking forward even beyond that, it's going to be tough to see much growth through, through the spring of next year, given the conditions right now. And you and other economists have been reminding us that we should bear our rapid population growth into in we should bear it in mind when looking at the economy so you say real gdp little changed over the past 6 months which is even weaker when you consider the population is expanding at a 3% annual rate yeah so that's a that's a real boost to the real underlying economy when you have you know the physical uh, population count growing at 3% per year that's that's 1.2 million people almost in the last year coming into Canada. So um, it, it, it makes it, it masks a lot of the weakness, I think, because some of the aggregate spending numbers are getting boosted by the fact that we have that 3% population growth. But when you drill down to, let's say, the individual level or the household level, I think, I think things start to look a lot more challenging. And you see that reflected in the per capita numbers where now year over year per capita GDP growth is pretty deeply negative to the to the point that we usually see only in times of recession. Obviously, it's a little bit different now because this time it's it's the denominator that's changing. It's the population number. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it masks some of the weakness in the economy in the aggregate, I think. Maybe we should start focusing on GDP growth per capita as well as overall growth. I, I think it's an important distinction for sure. And, and look back to, let's say, the end of 2016 where Canada has really the economy has grown in absolute terms, but on a per capita basis, we've seen no growth in that period. Um, and then you flip that picture south of the border, and we've seen almost 2%, one and a half or 2% per year real per capita growth. So it's a much different picture. Obviously, there are longer term benefits to this kind of population growth when you think of the labor force 5, 10, 20 years down the road. But as it stands right now, um, in per capita terms, yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing some, some pretty tough growth numbers. In terms of Bank of Canada policy, in, inflation stubborn, but you think the, these soft economic numbers do make a case to stay on, on hold uh, as regards interest rates? I think we're leaning that way, yeah, and that's our that's our official call that they're done here, but they're going to be here for a while. And, you know, I, I think they're in a bit of a tricky spot because you do have that sticky core inflation still, and then let's call it three and a half to four and a half percent, depending on the measure, and it's not really budging from that level. And the reality is that when you have 3% population growth, I, I personally think that the immediate impulse of that is inflationary. So that's complicating the story a little bit. It'll become disinflationary eventually, but it's not today because of all the stress we're seeing on the rental market and for, for personal services and things like that. But then you, you kind of contrast that with the fact that the labor market is slowing down and we've seen now six months of, as we said, no real economic growth in this country. So the bank has to balance those things. And I think... At the end of the day, the way they probably play this is, is they say, okay, policy is probably tight enough now. Uh, we're seeing evidence of that, but it hasn't been for long enough. And they're going to lean on it until they get pretty clear evidence that inflation is back down towards target. Robert, just remind us, um, 
I know this is a complicated question, but when oil goes up, it's kind of a mixed bag for the Canadian economy, isn't it? Because obviously it's great for Alberta and Saskatchewan, but we import so much oil in central Canada. Yeah, I would say historically it, it, it's, it's a net positive for Canada, but it also, it, it's a big factor in the regional and the industry landscape, obviously. So typically you would see um, a lot of growth in the oil producing provinces, obviously, at the expense of growth in areas like central Canada. That's, I mean, a pretty straightforward relationship, right? Um, I would say what we're seeing that's a little bit different this time is we're not seeing a lot of pass through into the Canadian dollar from, from higher oil prices. So typically in the past, you would have seen higher oil prices drive a stronger loonie and, and really weigh on Ontario and Quebec. We're not seeing that this time around. And one of the reasons, I think, is that there's just not as much let's say like economic, real economic leverage to higher oil prices. Yes, it's great for, for incomes and, and government budget balances and things like that in Alberta, but it's not driving the same kind of capital spending that you would have seen in the past. And that drives a lot of employment growth and real economic growth. So it's a little bit different now because most of those oil sands projects are pretty fully built out and more or less sustaining themselves and cranking out a lot of cash flow, yes, but not, not creating a lot of new capex and employment. So a little different environment. Robert,